Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're going to be discussing a VFD's user's manual. Now, many of you already realize that whatever VFD you purchase, uh, whether it be mine or anyone else's, you're going to get a user's manual with them. I have yet to see a unit actually come without one. That being said, I know there's a lot of BS online that the user's manuals are written like crap. You can't really understand the English and therefore you shouldn't read them. Well, that's a load of crap. And honestly, all of you should be trying to understand the user's manual as much as possible. Again, some of it gets into you know areas where you guys are really are going to find weak points as far as your understanding of it, which is fine. The big thing here is that you cover the main points, the points of hookup, as far as wiring the unit, the points of programming, you should try to understand as much of the programming, of course, as possible. And of course, going into the areas of grounding. And that's what I'm covering here today. And again, I'm dealing with an HY user's manual. This is on page 13, but many of you will see as we go through this, how this manual is written. For those of you not familiar and just getting involved with CNC as a genre, you want to make sure that every piece of documentation that comes with your system you're trying to digest. Once again, it's the only way you're going to learn. So to kick it off, I'm going to start on the first paragraph. We'll do a complete walkthrough. I'm breaking in some new software that's got some cool features as far as doing highlighting and whatnot because I really want you guys to get the most out of this. And again, I hope you stay tuned to the end because there'll be another video link so you guys can check out how ground loops work from a different perspective. Once again, an engineering perspective dealing with audible noise as far as um, dealing with acoustics because again, anybody dealing in uh, the musician's type industry, you're going to find they deal with uh, EMI as well. And again, it's cool to see how it crosses over because regardless of our genre, it's all an enemy to all of us. So first paragraph says here, please lower the carrier frequency when there is no longer distance between the inverter and the motor. Because of the higher carrier frequency is the bigger the leakage current of high order harmonics in the cables will be. The only thing you need to read here really is this last sentence. Because again, the English here, it's a little confusing. <clears throat> it's not too confusing enough, once again, once you read the last sentence. The leakage current will have an unfavorable effect on the inverter and other equipment. Leakage current, all they're talking about is EMI. Okay, electromagnetic interference, our largest enemy, once again, not only ours, once again, anybody dealing uh, with auto, audio noise, same principle. It's all the same, RFI, EMI. Uh, for control circuit wiring signal line, again, we, as we come over here, Stage two, uh, the signal line should be separately laid in a different conduit with the main circuit wire to avoid any possible interference. Well, many of you are not going to be using conduit because you're not in an industrial environment. If you do use conduit, of course, you'd want one that's metal based. If you're not uh, going to use a shielded cable, which I wouldn't understand anyways, all VFDs should be using cables that are double shielded. I'll say it again. All VFDs should be using cables that are double shielded. Okay. As we come over here, I wanted to highlight this. Please use the shielded cable with the size of 0.52 millimeter for signal lines. Now, again, guys, that's 24 gauge wire. That is very, very, very thin wire. And the thing to keep in mind is that they're talking about signal lines. Signal lines are not power leads. And when I say power leads, just to define a power lead, I'm talking about what's powering the inverter, okay, the VFD. So if we're looking at the VFD and its input is 110 or its input is 220, you want to make sure the minimum gauge wire you're using is 16 gauge. You do not want to go smaller than that. I've had guys request to go 18 gauge. I've had guys go to 20 gauge. We don't want to do that. We want to stay at 16 gauge. That is the proper gauge leads for your inverter. Now, does that mean it's for every inverter? Absolutely not. The, the larger the power output of the inverter, again, will increase wire size to supply the unit's power based on that. Okay, the more amps it draws, we need to make sure that we're not overheating our conductors, and that's done by, once again, going with a larger grade of, of conductor, which means a larger cable. Uh, once again here, these lines control VFD speed manipulation, and that's, uh, once again, going through Mach 3. Typical PWM output would be 0 to 10 volts. Um, you'll stay under 12 volts, and that's why I keep saying that signal lines are not power leads. When I say that, let me just be very precise in what I'm saying. Power leads are anything, once again, running the unit, not 
manipulating signals from your software to the VFD in order to control the spindle speed. It also would be cycling the spindle on and off. Now, if you want your spindle to cycle on and off, you'll be utilizing a relay in a dry contact configuration, which once again means dry contact means there's no voltage and no amps. So, so again, you can get away using a very thin lead. However, double shielded cable is required for this application. It's still receiving signals. We want to make sure your signals are clean. Okay. As we go over here, I want it to be very concise in what I'm explaining to you guys. American wire gauge, AWG, diameter in inches, diameter in millimeters, cross-sectional area millimeters. 16 gauge wire, once again, it's American wire gauge. You can see here the diameter in inches. You can see here the diameter of the conductors in millimeters, 1.29. This is for power, correct size for power requirement and flexibility. If you are running an 800 watt spindle up to four kilowatt spindle, the 16 gauge spindle cable that I have double shielded is designed to be fine for those applications. If we're going past four kilowatts, then we have to evaluate our amp usage. Um, I've only had very few clients actually go past that size um, and main, with main cause is because again, depending upon what you're doing, four kilowatts is a ton of power to work with as far as um, machining ability. So again, up until once again, 800 watts, those are those little point eight kilowatt spindles all the way up to four kilowatts we would be using 16 gauge now i have i have potential guys or potential clients excuse me contact me and say to me you know can i use 12 gauge or i want to use 14 gauge it's up to you again 16 gauge is required we will not go beneath that but the larger the gauge cable you use you're not building in extra stability like so many guys think they're doing. You're actually making it more difficult for that cable to be flexible inside the cable chain. So these are things you really want to think about before you start doing and moving forward with that because once you purchase the cable, many times the vendors will not return it, especially, uh, the, uh, actually McMaster is pretty good about it, but depending upon where you go, you'll definitely want to think about that because again, restocking fees, so on and so forth, if they cut the cable a special length, you're gonna be pretty much SOL. So take your time with that. I highly recommend staying with 16 gauge. I've picked that gauge for a reason. Again, my cable actually has uh, yarn twine in there inside the actual center of the cable separating the conductors so that as that cable flexes, there is a minimal, and I mean very minimal amount of stress on the conductors, and that's over duration, meaning the more that that cable flexes, you're not getting that traditional friction on your conductors. Again, double shielding is required. Double shielding meaning tin braided copper, meaning mylar foil. Those two levels of shielding with a drain lead is what is required. Signal lines only carrying uh, excuse me, signal lines only not for carrying high voltage. Okay, so when you guys, once again, we're going through this 110, 220, the 24 gauge, if you look at this American wire gauge, once again, look at the difference in the diameter in millimeters, 0.51, and we're at 1.29. I mean, it's massive, massive. I don't personally go that small, 24 gauge. I would go 22 gauge is fine. Um, that's just my own preference. 24 gauge is just really hard to work with. Um, again, we're dealing with, you know, very, very, very thin leads here. Um, but overall, if you're trying to manipulate from your software to your VFD to control the spindle's speed, this is the cable you would use, not the 16 gauge, only for power. And once again, signal lines only, not for carrying high voltage, 110 or 220. Okay. Hopefully I've made that clear. If you guys have questions, please message me. Um, coming over here now to one of the biggest topics I get asked all the time, grounding. And when I hear guys say that it's not covered in the manual, um, it, that's really frustrating because I know every manual discusses grounding. And I know you may not understand it fully, but you should get something out of this because you can see how well written this is here. Grounding, uh, grounding terminal E, be sure to correct ground, or excuse me, be sure they put correct grounding uh, to make correct grounding. Um, 220 volt class, the third grounding method, grounding resistance should be 100 ohms or lower. 
uh, 380 volt class, the special third grounding method, grounding resistance should be 10 or lower. Now, again, on the ohms, I've already covered that in previous videos. I recommend three or under. Um, if you're doing everything right, that should be really easy to attain. Using a quality meter, I would go through and double check that on your system. The entire system, I cannot emphasize that enough, should be a three ohms or lower. And I know there are certain systems out there that do not have components in areas that are meeting metal to metal, where they be conductive. If you're using um, bearings that are those roller plastic bearings on systems, again, um, on different machines, if it's not conductive, it's not going to ground through conduction on the remaining components if they're metal with they're not making metal to metal contact. So you'll have to go through the entire system and validate those specific areas that you're three ohms or lower, okay? If you guys have questions on that, you can check out my previous videos. I've done that. I'll put a link in the description at the bottom so you can check them out as well. Choose grounding wires according to the basic length size of the technical requirements of the electric equipment, okay? Uh, do avoid sharing grounding wire with other large power equipment such as electric welder, power machine, etc. The grounding wire should be kept away from the power supply wires for large power equipment. Um, again, this is interesting because if you're using a ground rod, it really it's irrelevant as far as what it's actually shared with. I have yet to see an issue with that. Um, again, this is more their interpretation on that perspective, but here is something we all need to realize. The grounding method for several inverters together should be done as the first and second diagrams. Now, they're saying for several inverters, in your case, many of you are only running one inverter, in that case, or one system. It's still going to be the same. Uh, should be done as the first and second diagrams below, and we'll come over here. Avoid the third loop, okay? And that's just meaning a ground loop, and I get asked about this topic all the time. This right here is illustrated in the user's manual on page 13. Once again, I told you I'm on page 13. And you can see what we've got here. We've got a terminal here, a terminal here, and a terminal here. All three are coming back to one central grounding point. This is known as a star point ground system. Okay, you see they have good. <laughs> so very basic. I've gotten asked about this topic numerous times. You can see here, this is explained. I mean, it's pretty much self-explanatory from what you're looking at. As we go to the next one, this is known as a daisy chain method. Okay, I've gotten asked about this. Guys do this with drives all the time. And when you're doing anything with power, this is not acceptable. They say it's acceptable because it's a ground method, and that's fine. It is acceptable in a ground method. I don't recommend it. This is best practice, but this will work, meaning there's one ground location, and then it goes from the ground right here, transfers over to this conductor, transfers over here, and therefore you've got a good ground. This, however, is not a good ground. This is considered a ground loop. And you can see what I've got illustrated here, lead attached twice. So we have the ground right here. This will be your ground rod, for instance. And then we're feeding off to our equipment. And you can see you have a lead coming in, lead coming in, lead coming in, and then another lead coming all the way back. That leaves the area open for differential and voltage potential, which could lead to a possible ground loop. I've gotten questions about guys reading um, more modern type literature on VFD cables where they're saying now to ground both ends. And again, I always answer that question the same way. You guys have to make the assessment of what to do with your system. I'm not there with you, but here's the way I look at it. And I've done this for years. If the information has been the same for years where it's been one end of the cable gets grounded as far as the shield drain to prevent the ground loop. I don't believe in changing that because if I change that, I leave myself open for the potential of a ground loop. To me, I'd rather not have the potential of a ground loop and see if I'm fine. If I find that I'm not fine, I could always ground the opposite end. I do not recommend that, and I will say that again, I do not recommend that overall because you will be doing exactly what's in this picture, okay? You will be creating a ground loop where we're once again, we're coming in, we're coming from the ground rod right here at the base, coming to a conductor, to a conductor, to a conductor, and then back over, which once again will formulate a potential ground loop, okay? So we do not want to do that. And again, I said lead attached twice so everybody can see right here that lead is connected twice, therefore creating the ground loop. Okay, so once again, I'm on page 13. Everybody knows that. 
I tried to keep this video down as low as possible in the amount of time, but now I hope many of you understand what these user's manuals actually show because again, what they're discussing is very, very basic. If you just follow this image right here, you'd be fine. I mean, really, you could follow these, these illustrations and get by. Uh, it says here at the end, the grounding wire must be uh, as short, they put as shorter as possible. I mean, uh, again, grammatical error, very minor. Um, short as possible, of course, we don't want it long. We'll have resistance. We're creating more resistance. We want to keep that resistance as low as possible. Um, and that's just best practice, okay? And I know that, you know, I, I may get questions on how short is short. Well, be reasonable. I mean, there's only going to be a certain amount of length you'll get away with for your particular system, and you guys just have to make your own judgment call on that. Um, as far as everything else goes, I want you guys, and I hope you guys will, watch the video link I've attached below on ground loops. It's a more uh, graphical version of discussing ground loops, once again, dealing with audio cables, but the principles are the same. For those of you that want to go into that and go over it in detail, please do. Once again, um, it's another engineer covering it, and it's it's done really, really exceptionally well. I love it. It's simple, and it, it's really cool how he shows everything. And on top of that, it gives you the breakdown of what we're dealing with, and we all deal with it. And I think that's imperative to see different areas of, of engineering that deals with it, regardless if we're dealing with audio or we're dealing with automation. So again, I hope this video has been helpful. If you guys do have questions, of course, contact me directly at storm2313 at gmail.com. That'll be up. You'll see it actually on the link of the video. It'll pop up. It should be somewhere on the screen. And Or you can contact me direct at eDealersDirect. Um, that's my eBay store. And I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, again, all links will be in the description below so that you guys then can follow through with the next video should you want to and also check out my fluke videos discussing um, the ohm resistance level because again that's another question i keep getting asked constantly take care guys thank you